This is my channel's weekly compendium, ending Monday, April 8th, 2024. Enjoy. Case file number 1556, written by Pseudonomist, a Beijing biker mystery. A few months ago, I was at the corner of an intersection in Beijing. A man on an electric bike with a few packages on the back, probably a courier, was crossing the intersection along the zebra stripes towards me. Just then, a small van was rounding the corner in front of me, directly across the path of the biker, who was going too fast to stop. I cringed as I heard the heavy thunk of his bike hitting the side of the van, but at least it didn't sound like he fell over or anything broke. The van stopped for a moment, but then drove off. But the biker was just gone. I had a clear view of every direction he could have ridden off, but he just had disappeared, as if he had been absorbed into the side of the van. Second story. On my wedding night, we were just going to bed when the phone started ringing. I picked it up and suddenly found myself sucked into this other… not sorry, just kidding. I picked it up and a man on the line asked, is this room 14? Is Kay Mitchell there? Sorry, I said. You have the wrong room. I hung up the phone a bit stunned. It was the name of my late grandmother. I never did find out who was in room 14. Bonus file written by Siuk. The Spectral Stroll of Mr. Bentley. Not my story, but a friend of mine. He is an old physics teacher, pretty open-minded. One day in the pub, we were talking about ghosts, and I suggested that a person's energy could be contained in items like big rocks or vehicles if that is where they died. He told me he had two ghost stories which he believed were true. I pressed him to tell me, and he told me about Mr. Bentley. When he had been in his early 30s, he lived next door to an undertaker's or chapel's of rest. One night, he was having a smoke before bedtime when he happened to look down into the garden of his apartment, which was between his building and the chapel of rest. In the garden, he saw the shape of a man made entirely out of what he described as Christmas tree lights. The shape walked around the garden and suddenly disappeared. A few days later, he was coming back from work and saw the undertaker cleaning his hearse in the yard. He said hello as usual and asked him about the thing he had seen in the garden. The undertaker told him, that's Mr. Bentley, he came in on Monday. My friend presumed the undertaker meant Mr. Bentley was a new member of staff, but Mr. Bentley wasn't. He was sitting in the chapel of rest, waiting for a distant relative to take care of the arrangements. My friend was shocked and said that he felt as though someone had walked over his grave. The undertaker laughed and told him it wasn't the first time one of his customers had been seen taking a walk in the gardens. He wouldn't tell me his other story. Bonus file, written by the writer Ben, The Mystery of the White Object One time I was sitting at my computer goofing off when a small white object flew out of nowhere and hit my desk. I picked it up and it appeared to be PVC or something similar and had broken off from something. The object was shaped funny and broken at an odd fracture. I looked everywhere and could not find anything in the entire house that it could have broken off from. In the same room I would hear my keyboard randomly typing at night. I even left my computer on with a Word document for a few nights as suggested by the woman who is now my girlfriend, but nothing happened those nights. I also have dreamed of several places that I later saw in real life that I had never seen. I still have locations that reoccur in dreams that I wonder if I might just visit someday. I once dreamed that my sister became pregnant and lost the baby. The next day I told my brother about the dream and he became white as a sheet and had a look I'd never seen in him before for unbeknownst to me, my sister and her husband had recently become pregnant and only to miscarry soon after. My family barely ever talked to me unless there was a reason and my brother was the first I had talked to since it happened. On the morning of April 19th, 1995, I was just a young child riding on the school bus when I had an extremely strong and persistent feeling that something bad was going to happen. I didn't know what, but the feeling was overwhelming until suddenly it melted away and I said to myself, it happened. Minutes later, as the regularly scheduled news segment on the radio came on, the DJ announced the breaking news that minutes earlier, an explosion had happened at the Alfred P. Murrah building in Oklahoma City. Yes, the Oklahoma City bombing. Oh, and I had watched and looked at the time. Upon realizing it had happened at 8.02, I lived in the mountain time zone and the event happened central. So it would have been an hour ahead, 9.02, the exact time of the bombing. I had similar feelings the morning of 9.11, the Japanese tsunami, and when the morning my family found out that my infant cousin had been murdered the previous night. I have had many strange things happen, 
but the one I will end with is on Halloween when I was young. I lived way out in the country and at one point in the night I looked out the glass door and saw the grim reaper standing past the yard behind the ditch. This filled me with an extreme fear and I looked away quickly. Then out of curiosity I looked back, moments later, and saw nothing. I recently asked my siblings and cousins if they had done it to trick me, and they all said no, they never did such a thing, that they would have remembered, but that would have been funny to do. Plus if they did, by nature, they would torment me about it later. Remind me to tell you all about the hermit who died from eating the poison apple. That is a fun one and took me years to feel safe eating apples from our orchard again. Case file number 1557, written by Just JBC, the VHS tape that defied time. When I was about 4 years old, I used to have this VHS tape of forgotten Merry Melodies, Max Fleischer cartoons circa mid-1930s, titled Robin Hood. After the first cartoon, featuring three squirrel brothers playing a make-believe game of Robin Hood, it was a cheap video cassette, probably came from a dollar store, because it didn't even have the title printed on the label, just a blank field where you could write the title yourself, which I did in my best four-year-old writing. My parents bought lots of these kinds of tapes, which included old episodes of Popeye, Daffy Duck, etc. But I adored this particular collection for some reason. I remember bringing it to my kindergarten class once to watch on a movie day. Anyway, the years went by and eventually it just sat unwashed on a shelf. Around age 9, I had developed this entrepreneurial streak and decided to sell all my old toys and things at a garage sale so I could invest in cooler things like video games. I think I sold it for $1, which would be kind of a ripoff considering that's probably how much it cost in the first place, then promptly forgot all about it. Seven years later, I was in a value village, a chain of thrift stores called Savers in the US, looking through a pair of jeans when suddenly I had a flash of images from these old cartoons in my mind. Naturally, I felt all nostalgic and started wishing I hadn't sold the tape all those years ago. Then it occurred to me that maybe, however incredibly unlikely, the tape might actually be in the store. I got very excited and beelined straight for the books, videos, music section. It felt like a magnet was pulling me straight to a certain place on one of the shelves. Somehow I just knew the video was there. I walked right up to the shelf, reached out and pulled out the tape. There was no searching involved. I held it in my hands and looked it over. It was the same tape I used to have. I was immediately overjoyed that I would get to see those old cartoons again. But then I remembered, the writing on the label, could it really be possible it was exactly the same tape? I pulled the cassette out of the box and sure enough, there it was. Robin Hood. Spelled out in my terrible four-year-old handwriting, I was completely dumbstruck. I took it to the cashier in a state of ecstatic shock, tried to explain the story to her, but she said nothing and just looked at me like I was crazy. I don't blame her, they probably get all kinds of weirdos in there. I gladly paid two dollars for it. I still have it. Still works. Aside from the aforementioned Robin Hood, full title is actually Robin Hood Makes Good. The other cartoons included on the tape are the Dover Boys of Pimento University, really weird but hilarious Chuck Jones short, The Kids in the Shoe, a spin on the little old lady who lived in the shoe, featuring a pretty awesome jazz and swing number at the end, and Somewhere in Dreamland, which is guaranteed to make you ball unless you have no soul. They can all be found on YouTube. Case file number 1558, written by Smash IV, The Strange Happenings by Black Lake. My girlfriend and I were camping in a cabin on the shore of Black Lake, near the Thousand Islands in August 2010. The lady's cell phone tweaked out a bit, and to investigate the insides, I had taken a tiny screw out of the back and set it on a small bedside table, but got distracted by the splendor of the outdoors and left things messy. We came back to the cabin later on and found ourselves locked out. The door wouldn't budge, so I went to the bedroom screen window and realized I could force it up enough to wedge my fingers in and unlatch the window. I reached in, picked up the bedside table, and tipped it over onto the bed so I could crawl in. I got in, closed the window, put the table back behind me, and then unlocked the front door. I then remembered that I had taken the cell phone apart and cursed because that tiny screw was on the table I tipped over. That's why you don't leave crap undone. I went back to the bedroom and that stupid microscopic screw was sitting directly on the table where I had originally left it. There's absolutely no way it wouldn't have been flung off the table when the table was tipped over onto the bed. I wasn't gentle. My mind was blown. Late that night, the lady and I decided to throw caution to the wind and take some foolhardy risks. 
immediately preceding the initiation of joy, the smoke alarm spontaneously started blaring its horrors directly over our heads, then stopped. It wasn't a fire, it wasn't carbon monoxide, the 9 volt battery tasted very fresh. It totally killed the mood. A friend a couple rooms away didn't get woken up by the smoke alarm, but she did hear a child laughing in the living room of the cabin in the middle of the night later in the week. I don't believe in ghosts. The matrix definitely glitched up somehow. Case file number 1559, written by Anonymous. The mystery of Johnny from the desert. My best friend and I were driving through the desert on a cross-country road trip. We pulled into a rest stop at night. I remember it was the first rest stop after the one near the Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. I got out and began refilling our water bottles. And my friend came along because it was unfamiliar territory. A tall, thin man came walking up to us and asked if we'd mind sharing the water spigot. He looked a little tweaked out, a little nervous, but didn't come across as threatening towards us. He was very open and friendly, introducing himself. It's been years, but I think he gave his name as Johnny. We ended up sitting down and talking for a while. Morgan, my friend, and I broke out some provisions and made a midnight picnic. Johnny asked our story, and we talked about the trip so far. We asked Johnny's story. It started out normally enough. I've been away from home for a long time. Lost my way. Working my way back. Getting my head right. Then it got a little more weird. His dad was an evil man. A man with the devil inside him. Not the devil himself, he said. That would just be crazy. But a serious dose of evil lived in the heart of Johnny's dad. And that's what Johnny had run away from. It messed him up pretty bad, he said. Living close to an evil like that is almost radioactive. It bleeds off, gets into your hair, your clothes, your skin, and your thoughts. He was ashamed he ran away, he said. But he needed time to build his strength. He spoke to his ancestors in the desert, he said. He had a vision quest. And his path was made clear. Now he was going back to face his father. You can't just hide from the devil forever, you know. So we figured Johnny was a little nuts, but we were on a road trip, and hearing him out seemed like the thing to do. Finally, it was time for us to get back on the road. We were driving on through to Vegas, and Johnny had an appointment to keep. We left him sitting there, with a bottle of water and a bag of jerky. Nuts or not, we had a despair, and he looked like he could use it. He wasn't carrying anything with him but his clothes. We drove to Vegas, then through to California. We spent a week in Modesto, enjoying perfect weather and real mountains. Then drove to Seattle and cut across to Yellowstone. We spent a week camping in the back country, then started home. We pull into a rest stop in South Dakota near the Badlands, and I'm stretching my legs when I hear, Hey, how was Vegas? And there was Johnny, 2,000 miles and 3 weeks and change later, standing in front of us in broad daylight. Case file number 1560, written by Cabjack05, Dreambound Chronicles. I have several stories, but I'll go with the weirdest one. I have a friend who writes fantasy stories. She has a few unpublished novels and probably hundreds of short stories. Before going back to school, I would write fairly occasionally as well, so we would often discuss ideas for stories late at night. One evening, I was talking to her online and she hinted at a story she was writing that had a character based on me as the main villain. That was the only detail she provided before I logged off for the day. I went to bed early that night and had a vivid detailed dream about being chased by several people in a large tower. I could see every detail on the eclectic mix of people who were after me, down to what they were carrying. There were several events that occurred in the dream that are hardly worth mentioning here, but the people in the dream exchanged dialogue at times, both with me and with each other. In the morning, I got online and told my friend about the vivid dream I had. I didn't get a reply for a while until she told me to check my email. In my inbox was a chapter from her book that she wrote the night before while I was sleeping. It was the one with my character in it, confronting the heroes of the story in this tower. Each detail was the same, with the exception of the dialogue, which was essentially the same, but not verbatim. The odd thing is, I wasn't even weirded out. At the time, it seemed perfectly natural that I would dream about what she was writing while I was asleep. Case file number 1561, written by The Yuri, The Enchanted Wardrobe. I was about six or seven, at a birthday party for someone I didn't know well. Being a shy kid, I looked for a place with not too many people and ended up wandering into a bedroom. I sat down on the floor with a comic book. After a few minutes, an old lady came into the bedroom, didn't notice I was there, opened the wardrobe door, went inside and closed the door behind her. I thought that was strange, so I got up and opened the door. 
The wardrobe was full of ladies' dresses. I closed the door and went back to my place on the floor, trying to figure it out. I had barely sat down. The wardrobe opened and a young lady came out. A young lady that looked a lot like the old lady that had gone in, only young. When she left the bedroom, I went to investigate again. This time, I went into the wardrobe and found a door in the back. I opened it and entered an enchanted land, a young girl's bedroom, but with trays of candy and boxes of brand new toys everywhere. Looking behind me, I noticed the wardrobe exactly like the one I had left in the previous bedroom. Finally, I freaked out and went back the way I had come. I looked for my mom and told her my story of the magic wardrobe that turned old ladies into young ladies and the fairyland with all the candy and toys. My mom had a laughing fit. As it turns out, these people had purchased two houses that shared a wall. They wanted to create a passage between them, but unfortunately that shared wall was between the two bedrooms, and there was no convenient place for wardrobes in any of them. The candy and toys were for the birthday party, and the old and young ladies were mother and daughter. So how did the wardrobes get there? And how did they connect two rooms through solid wall? Case file number 1562, written by Zoo the Nymph, the mysterious Manhattan encounter with Cynthia. In 2007, I was walking down a Manhattan street when an old woman smiled at me and said, Oh, my full name, how are you doing? I had never seen her before. Her demeanor was so calm that it threw me off and I was unable to ask who she was. She continued, it's Cynthia from 3H. I hope I'm not ever too loud. Does the noise bother you? I did not live in a building with an apartment 3H. I have never in the past either. In fact, I lived in a brownstone where there was only one unit per floor, no 3H, and I was on the third floor. I did not know any of my neighbors, though there were certainly no old ladies in my whole building. Confused, I just mumbled that I hadn't noticed any noise and we said goodbye is the CIA after me. Case file number 1563, written by Vix Not Special. Pause for thoughts. I'm currently at a friend's house. Just a few minutes ago, they were taking their dog out on a walk. They have two dogs that they walk one after the other every couple hours. Sometimes when I'm over there, I walk with them. But today, I just wasn't really feeling it to be honest. I come from the northwest and moved down to the southwest eight months ago and I still haven't adjusted to the heat, so to me even a walk around the block in the spring is super hot. So this time I stayed inside. The dogs are named Bruce and Ozzy, just for some quick context. Anyways, we're at his house alone, his parents are working, and his older brother is out with friends, and my friend Ron had just gotten back from walking Ozzy a little over half an hour ago. Then he came back and switched out, taking the leash off of Ozzy and putting it on Bruce before leaving the house and taking out Bruce. Ozzy came into Ron's room, where I was and still am, and just laid on the bed. Almost 10 minutes after Ron had left with Bruce, I heard some shuffling noises from Ron's brother's room and thought nothing of it, because he also has a cat. But a few moments later, I hear the door to his brother's bedroom creak open, and the sounds of footsteps, and out of his brother's bedroom and into the hallway, right in front of Ron's room, comes Bruce. It took me a moment to really register what I saw. But when I did, I just sort of looked at the dog. He just stood right in front of the room, wagging his tail a little like he normally would. Ozzy, who was still on the bed with me, immediately perked up and hopped off the bed, sniffing Bruce for a moment before returning to the bed and whining, sort of looking back and forth between me and the other dog. Not once have I heard Ozzy make noise other than the first time I came over to my friend's house where he barked a little bit and that was it. So hearing him just suddenly start whining brought me an uncanny feeling. I literally just sat and stared. After a moment, Bruce left from out in front of the bedroom door, ate food from the dog bowl, drank some water, and just did all the normal dog things. That's the best way I can explain it. I was so confused and after like a minute of my staring, I finally looked away just thinking, what the hell? Before getting up and walking over to the dog, he was literally right there. I petted him and he licked my hand and arms as I did so. Then he retreated back into Ron's brother's bedroom and as soon as he disappeared around the corner, Ron opened the door and walked inside with Bruce and I was just standing in the corner. I didn't say anything at all about it to him, but I swear to God either I'm hella hallucinating because I could literally feel the wet spots on my hand and arm from where Bruce licked me just a moment prior after Ron walked in, or this is a serious glitch. Anyways, I haven't said anything about it to him 
but it's honestly the most freaky crap I've ever experienced and I have genuinely no explanation. I'm completely sober, I haven't touched drugs or alcohol ever in my life. I'm not even remotely tired and I even feel like I know I wasn't just imagining things since not only me, but also Ozzy, made physical contact with the duplicate dog. Power in my town went out all day from the moment I woke up and so did the service, which sucks. So this is an update at night. I got back from Mexico last night and passed out. I just drove over to Ron since I couldn't text him to ask if I could come over, but I promised I'd come see him when I was back. We hung out for a little while and went on a walk through the flood wash by my house. That's when I told him what I experienced. It went essentially how I expected. He didn't believe me. He thought I was just making stuff up at first. When I told him I was serious, he just went quiet. For a little. Then brushed it off and said something like, Yeah, sure. Very sarcastically. I didn't bring it up again. I'm not really upset that he didn't believe me because I know it happened. And I know I'm not lying. In fact, I'm actually sort of glad he just thought I was being weird and making up crap. Because to me, that's better than him thinking I'm crazy or something. It's nice to know some people believe me. There are a lot of stories similar to mine, so I know that stuff like this does in fact happen, and it helps me find something to relate to, even if this is really the only glitch I've ever experienced. Case file number 1564, written by Dark Snow, Black-Eyed Visitors at Dusk. I am hesitant to even write this, because words on paper make it seem real and I don't want it to be real. But it was, at least I believe it was, many years ago. When I was a senior in high school, I was at home by myself, as both my parents were teachers and it was a parents' night. I was in the kitchen, fixing myself a bite. It was about dusk, when I heard a knock at the front door. Now, this in of itself was odd, as this was a small town, and pretty much anyone who comes to our house knows to come to the carport, because the front door was rarely, if ever, used. I went to the door and opened it, leaving the glass storm door shut. Outside on my front porch stood two kids, a boy and a girl. For a second, I thought maybe someone had gotten their wires crossed and brought their kids to the teacher's house for parents' night, but that would be really strange. So I discounted the idea. I asked them, Can I help you? Then thinking that maybe they were selling candy bars or magazines or Girl Scout cookies or popcorn or any of the zillion billion things that kids come around shilling, the little girl said, Can we come in? We need to use your phone. Now bear in mind, this was a small town, and at the time this was, it would have been no big deal to let someone in, even a stranger, use the phone, particularly a child. I happened to have the cordless phone in my pocket, so I offered it to them, and the girl looked at me and said, No, we need to come inside. I was about to let them when all of a sudden I got hit with the most incredible sick horror feeling in the pit of my stomach, all the hair raised on the back of my neck and I had a total fight or flight response that I have no reasonable explanation for. I am always inclined to listen to these responses, but my hand was going to the door to open it anyway, and it was like I couldn't stop myself, despite the cold, sweaty palm terror I was stricken with. In the last second, I turned my hand from its path towards the latch, hit the light switch with my hand instead, and turned the porch light on. The porch light lit these kids up, and I swear, they had the blackest eyes I'd ever seen. Like they were wearing those black full sclera contact lenses. I let out a squeak and slammed the door shut, locked it behind me. The knocking started again almost immediately. I ran and locked all the other doors in the house and ran and hid in the dining room with my dog, who was growling like I'd never heard her growl before. Finally, the knocking stopped, and when it did, the feeling of terror lifted and the dog calmed down. When my parents got home, I told them about it, but they thought I must have been sleeping and had a nightmare. I did my best to put it out of my head and went on with my life. I had myself half convinced that it was a dream or something I'd imagined, despite the fact that I am not the kind of person who does that sort of thing. I am calm and rational and meet tales like these with questions and skepticism. So some sort of terror-driven paranoia, home alone imagining, was right out. It's also worth mentioning that I am completely sober and chemical free at the time. A couple years ago, I heard someone talking about Becks or black eyed kids, and all the old memories came flooding back. I did some internet research and found that so many people have had similar experiences to mine, almost down to the letter, and the cold feeling of horror, terror, fear, these kids emanate. I never open the door to anyone anymore without checking the peep, which is a safe thing to do, anyways. 
I am sitting here at work in a full room of people, and when I think about this and those kids and their eyes, I get cold chills I won't quit because someday I'm afraid I'll meet them again and I won't be able to stop myself from letting them in. Case file number 1565, written by Lingering Dorkness. The Forgotten Espresso Machine. I was looking through old photos on my phone the other day. I noticed in one photo of a place I lived in around eight years ago, there is an espresso coffee machine on the kitchen counter. Why is this odd? I have absolutely no recollection of ever owning a coffee machine. Everything else in the photo I remember owning, but not that machine. I literally have no memory of ever having a coffee machine. In the photo I can see my French press, I always used until I did buy an espresso machine two years later. Why would I use a French press if I had an espresso machine? Indeed, why would I buy an espresso machine two years later if I already had one? And the one I bought, which I still have, looks nothing like the one in the photo, so I'm not simply mistaken as to when I bought it. I asked a couple mates who used to drop in for a cup and chat at the place I lived in eight years ago, and neither of them can remember me having a coffee machine. Whenever they popped over, they remember me either offering them a French press coffee or a cup of tea. I drink a lot of coffee, so this is not something I would simply forget owning. I have a photo of an item no one, including myself, has any memory of me ever owning. I have no memory of me buying it, using it, taking it with me when I move to another town, or disposing of it. I only remember using a French press until I bought a coffee machine six years ago. What's going on here? Case Alt Safal 1556, a Beijing biker mystery. So as a cyclist who loves e-bikes, this is very unsettling, <laughs> especially unsettling for me. There are distracted people everywhere, and I certainly don't want to fuse into a van if I crash into one, <laughs> or die, <laughs> either would be terrible. I guess it's multiverse sight, but that doesn't explain the fusion of the cyclist into the van, that's just bizarre. Although even, I don't have an explanation for that one, but you got me on the joke of <laughs> Fusing into the phone, but no, it was just your grandma from a different reality. But who is the man? Was it her husband? Hmm. Case notes for the bonus file. The spectral stroll of Mr. Bentley. Imagine checking into a hotel as a ghost and the receptionist is completely welcoming and yeah, it's just another Tuesday. No big deal. Nice. We should all be so welcoming to ghosts. Friendly ghosts at least. And I guess they qualify under the Disabilities Act, right? They're kind of disabled, although they do have some neat powers, so I mean, who's to say? <laughs> Case notes for the bonus file, The Mystery of the White Object. So yeah, there's a lot going on in this story, but I wanted to focus on the PVC pipe that just came from nowhere. Because we have returning object phenomena, but again, as specified before, it can come from any universe. So there probably is a universe out there where you have exposed PVC pipe in your room, and it just broke off, and a piece of it vanished while falling. And voila, now it's just in your universe. It's so simple and so elegant. It's almost like a simple, beautiful equation. Kinetic energy is half mass times velocity squared. It's beautiful in its simplicity. And when something can explain something so beautifully, accurately, well, what's not to love about that? Now, it's just a hypothesis. I wouldn't say this is a theory. Theory is too tested. We still have so much more to go before we get to that point, but still great because it really does fit well so far. And now time for the quote of the day. Learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all. Michael Masser and Linda Creed. Well, along similar lines, they say, you can't love someone else unless you love yourself, and I believe that's true. If you don't love yourself, you literally have no foundation to even stand up on, let alone build a house of love. And I also think people who don't appreciate themselves, they're not as secure, so they'll be more clingy and, you know, not that clingy is wrong, but especially early on, you want to temper it. You want to be sure that you're okay in yourself, so you don't need someone else. It's just a bonus. It's an addition to your life. If you need them to live to survive, that's dangerous. Okay, so it's about 1557. The VHS tape that defied time. So there was a somewhat recent story similar to this, where there was a book that was seemingly bound to the person that had sold it or lost it, and they were just in a bookstore and they immediately found the book. It was calling to them, like a magnetic lure. And my postulate is that 
When we're attached to an object in proximity to it and think about it a lot and hold it, then part of our soul can infuse into it, not like a horcrux in Harry Potter or anything evil. I think it's just imbued with our own energy, which is really what our soul is. Our energy. And then finding it again is easy because we are connected to it. It's like the one ring. It calls to us. <laughs> but again, not evil, just natural. Que Sans 1558, The Strange Happenings by Black Lake, The Initiation of Joy. Nice euphemism, I might borrow this one. <laughs> so I love when glitches are manifested in the tiniest of objects. You don't need a giant event or a giant object to explain or visualize a glitch. It can be the smallest thing, a tiny screw that had to have fallen but didn't. It's impossible that it didn't. You know it, we all know it, but it didn't. Anomaly. Universe. Faulty. Simple as that. Now time for the joke of the day. A soldier survived mustard gas in battle, and then pepper sprayed by the police. He's now a seasoned veteran. I want to say he probably tastes good, but maybe that's going too far. Que sans fin 1559. The mystery of Johnny from the desert. So you were acting as inspiration for each other, almost like guardian angels, but maybe more so for Johnny. And then meeting him again later on are pushing into astronomical odds. It just couldn't happen, right, unless something willed it to happen. Or maybe you were drawn to each other, through your own energies intermingling and needing each other. My guess is that little interaction you had gave him the necessary catalyst, the spark, to go on, press on, and face his father, face his demon. And I really hope he did. Que Sans 1560, Dreambound Chronicles. One of the most exciting stories I've ever read. Pure interconnected minds. Minds are advanced biological computers. Computers can easily connect to each other via Wi-Fi, the internet. So why not human brains too? I think we do all the time on the subconscious level. I think the dreamlike state is sort of like that. Sure, we're inside our own subconscious, but I think we're sharing with other minds too. Maybe more in the vicinity of each other, but I don't know if distance really matters all that much. It's more about who our minds have made contact with and connected with, established that connection. But like with computers, you can close off your ports, and if you close off your ports, your firewall is up, maybe then you're shut off and you won't experience this. Now, how do you open them, close them? That's, that's a tough one. It's not as simple as going on a computer and pressing a button. Interpreting information, even if all your ports are open, is not simple, even for the subconscious, which is why it makes sense to me that the dialogue interpretation was not verbatim. So you lost something in translation. Que Sotsafa, 1561. The Enchanted Wardrobe. Chronicle of Narnia vibes indeed. Fiction so often borrows from reality. Maybe vice versa, but I think definitely both. There's a solid wall, not supposed to be a wardrobe there, and then there was, at least for a moment in time. You didn't mention if you went back to check again, I'm guessing not, or if you did it wasn't there anymore. But it's pretty clear that you really did cross into the other room, you described it as it was, and it wasn't a magical fantasy land, it was just the other side of the, the home, the two homes connected, but it passed through a solid wall, <laughs> that's not supposed to be able to do that. On the quantum level, sure, particles do that all the time, electrons mostly. Not us in the macro scale, not supposed to happen. Hope you got some candy out of it. Now time for the joke of the day. I was wondering why the ball was getting bigger. Then it hit me. <laughs> eh, decent hit. Like the video, subscribe, hit the bell. Oh, and Dave is okay. Que Sans 1562. The Mysterious Manhattan Encounter with Cynthia. I do think that our guardian angels occasionally want to make contact with us, and it makes a certain level of sense if you're charged and tasked with protecting someone. Even just as a normal bodyguard in real life, you do grow a certain attachment to them that's inevitable just being in proximity to someone. And I assume it depends on the type of person they're in charge to protect. What if a guardian angel is assigned to someone that is evil? What if Hitler had a guardian angel? That would be wild. How could you perform your duty? It's almost like defense attorneys who have to defend evil people, child murderers and stuff like that. Everyone needs a defense. It's part of the system. And I guess this would apply on the meta level, the higher level. 
everyone needs a guardian angel, or maybe maybe not. <laughs> but if someone does is assigned a guardian angel, you have to protect them no matter what. Anyways, that's a tangent just occurred to me. It's very interesting to consider that even evil people might have guardian angels. Or the other option is you just have one of those familiar faces and this older woman thought that she knew you, but she didn't. That's also possible. Mundane, but perfectly reasonable explanation. <laughs> Not as fun, though. Quesantes of File 1563. Pause for thoughts. So this is confirmation that dogs do indeed have souls. At least some of them do. And when they manifest or project out in astral projection, they can constitute matter itself. And you know this because you interacted directly with a dog. You petted it and it licked you. And you even felt a slobber on your hand after the fact. So that was real matter on your hand, all constituted from a spirit. That or it was a multiverse event. But again, you had the mass on your hand. If it was a different universe, it wouldn't stick to you because you're just there in, in your soul form, not your real form. Neither fit perfectly, but I guess if I had to choose one, it would be astral projection, just being more powerful than we even know. And now time for the quote of the day. Get your facts first. Then you can distort them as much as you please. Mark Twain. Yeah, sadly, this is how most people operate. It's just a human condition where you have your presuppositions, your biases, and you build from there. Instead of trying to objectively look at the world and see what is true, what is correct, what works. Doing that takes much more effort, and it can be difficult to introspect and self-analyze to determine if you're even doing it properly. We're all so biased, it's very difficult. Not an easy challenge to overcome, but we should all strive to be as impartial and objective as we can be. And if you're biased, at least try to be aware of it. Quesantes of 1564. Black-Eyed Visitors at Dusk. Reports of becks or black-eyed kids are rather intense and rather extensive. But these reports, most curiously, don't stretch back that far. More like the 1990s where they started to appear. It's a kind of modern myth or legend. But the most notable one was Brian Bethel, who was a journalist. Something I think was in a parking lot in Texas of a movie theater. He was approaching his car and then two kids came around and asked for a ride home. But then he was overcome with this intense fear and foreboding that he couldn't explain because it's just two kids. Of course, then when you see the black eyes, that's almost like looking into the abyss and it's looking back at you. <laughs> you didn't intend to look there, but you are. So maybe these are just possession events, demons that are possessing kids and guiding them towards a certain event. It's like the vampire mythos where the vampire has to be invited in. I think there is a certain level of truth to that in general, to the cosmic nature of reality, where if you're evil and you're not asking for consent first from the victim, then there will be repercussions for you. But if you ask for consent and they accept you in, you're in the clear, even if you're evil. Something like that. Or the other option is that these are alien possessions, or maybe alien constructed bodies that aren't entirely accurate. It's like the uncanny effect in CGI where you just know something is quite wrong, but you can't exactly pinpoint it. Minus the eyes in this case, which are pure blackness, which is, um, if they're aliens, they're, they need to get that fixed out, because that's a pretty obvious tell. Quesantes of File 1565. The Forgotten Espresso Machine. Hi, new universe. Here, there's an espresso machine. I guess you can't enjoy it because it happened before, but it is a telltale sign that you're in a new universe, in the grand ocean of the multiverse. He found one which had a weird espresso machine. <laughs> Honestly, if I found concrete evidence of this, like in a picture of something that I know never happened, then I would go full Sherlock Holmes and try to determine all the pieces that aren't quite fitting correctly in this new universe. Of course, that's with my knowledge of the multiverse, which a lot of people don't have, and then they, they get ported to a new place that's a bit different, and they, they don't have this basis, the foundation of our knowledge to build on. For us, it'd be more of a um, adventure, I guess you could say. It'd be like those games you played as a kid or a teenager where there are two images and you have to find all the differences between them. Kind of fun, and I guess you could apply that, but to the whole universe. Everything that's different. Maybe if you find all the differences, you get a reward. <laughs> Probably not, though. Now time for the quote of the day. War is a cowardly escape from the problems of peace. Thomas Mann. Yep, war is simple. Especially, I think, as men, we are geared for battle. We tend to simulate it if we can't have the real thing. In video games or LARPing, going to events where you're pretending to be a warrior and fighting other people, it's in our DNA 
to be combatants, to be fighters. Not just that, but it is part of us. If we're too cowardly to suppress that part of ourselves, and go full on to embrace it in reality, where we might be built for something, but it doesn't mean it's good. War is hell. Truly. And sometimes maybe it's unavoidable, but that doesn't mean it's something that you should embrace. And yeah, <laughs> oftentimes there's no need for war at all, but people are just not content with peace. Because peace is unlimited potential. You don't know what's going to happen. In war, you have a gun, he has a gun, go at it. Or you have a sword, he has a sword, go at it. It's simple. It's raw. But peace is anything but simple. Ironically, peace is total chaos but in the best way possible. It takes a lot of bravery to embrace it, but I think we'll get there. Like the video, subscribe, hit the bell. Kinetic Symphony, signing off.